Hi everyone, thanks for attending my session. My name is Dian Lun Lin. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Utah. I'm so glad to be here to share my experience on C++ coroutines. In this talk, I'll give you an introduction to C++ coroutines. I'll also give you a concrete example about how I implement a scheduler, specifically for C++ coroutines. The code used in this talk is open source and uh, is available on the GitHub link shown below. So feel free to take a look. Here's what I'm going to present for today's talk. <clears throat> By today's talk, you'll learn what is coroutine. And you'll understand the motivation behind coroutine, like what's the benefit of using coroutine. And I'll dive into four components of C++ coroutines. First, coroutine. And promise, available, finally, coroutine handle. I'll then demonstrate how I implement a scheduler for C++ coroutines. I'll give you three examples, single-threaded, multi-threaded, and CPU-GPU scheduler. And finally, I'll evaluate the scheduler on a CPU-GPU benchmark. I'll do a performance comparison between scheduler with and without using coroutines. Let's get started. <coughs> so what is coroutine? A coroutine is a function that can suspend itself and resume by color. A typical function or a normal function you all know is actually a subset of coroutine. So let's say this is a function. And what the caller does is to call a function. And the function will do some computation and execute some stuff. And then finally, you will call return and go back to the caller. Caller will continue to do its work. On the other hand, if you are using coroutine, what you can do is to call a call a coroutine. And coroutine will do some stuff and then suspend itself and go back to the caller. And caller can resume it again. And then coroutine will begin at this suspension point and then continue to do its work and then suspend again and so on and so forth. <coughs> so that is coroutine. Coroutine is a function that can suspend itself and resume by color. So why do we want to use coroutine? What's the motivation of using coroutine? We already have functions, and it seems like it works pretty well. Why do we want to use coroutine? Imagine you want to do two things when you go home. You got tired, and all you want to do is to boil the water and then get a hot drink, and you also want to take a shower. Suppose each thing is a function. Suppose you are single, you live alone. What you can do is to boil the water first and take a shower. Or you can take a shower first and then boil the water. But no matter what you do, you always need to go to the kitchen and then heat the water. And you need to wait until the water is boiling because it is a function. But if each thing is a coroutine, what you can do is to go to the kitchen, turn on the stove, and then you go back to take a shower. And after you take a shower, you go back to the kitchen to check whether the water is boiling. If it is boiling, you turn off the stove and go back, enjoy your hot drink. So you can see there is an overlap between boiling the water and taking a shower. And that's the benefit of using coroutine. So conclusion, coroutine is very useful if you have a stove. <laughs> <laughs> um, not really. Coroutine is very useful if you have other computing results. For example, you got GPU, you got TPU, or you are doing async I.O. So this is an example without coroutine. In the code shown on the left here, I have a CPU work. And inside this CPU work, I can do, for example, matrix multiplication. I have another work here. I use CUDA for programming GPU code. Um, to offload a kernel to GPU, you need to create a stream first. Stream is like a test queue in the GPU. When you call a kernel, you need to specify 
which string you want to enqueue. So inside this GP work, you will need to create a string first. And then I call a kernel, this GPU matrix medication is a kernel. And now enqueue this kernel to the string. So <coughs> when I call line nine, that means uh, GPU will start to do its work to do the GPU's uh, matrix modification. And what I'll do next is to synchronize. So I need to synchronize the stream. That means I need to wait until GPU finishes its work, until this function, this kernel, is finished. And finally, I'll destroy the stream. So in the main function, suppose CPU work and GPU work are independent to each other. And assume we only have one CPU thread. What you can do is to either do CPU work first and then GPU work. Or you can do GPU work first and CPU work. But no matter what you do, inside this GPU work, I have synchronized. So I need to wait until GPU finishes work. On the <coughs> other hand, if we are using coroutine, so here I change this GPU work function to a coroutine. There's a keyword here called wait, suspend always. And the return type is a coroutine object defined myself. Um, right now, you only need to know this GPU work becomes a coroutine. I'll talk about the details later. So here, um, it's almost the same. It said that I change from synchronize to these three lines of code. And what these three lines of code is doing is to keep curing the status of the stream and then check whether the status of string is <coughs> cooldown success. If it is success, that means I finish the work and I can go to destroy the stream. Otherwise, I will call call wait. When I call call wait suspend always, that means I will suspend this coroutine and then go back to the caller. So in the main function, what I can do is to execute this GPU work first. So here I execute the GPU work. Here I create a stream executing the matrix modification and go into this while loop. When I first in enter into this while loop, I'm most likely to not get in CUDA cast success. So I'll go into this call wait. And what it means is to suspend this coroutine, go back to the caller. So I go back to the caller uh, main function. And I start to execute the CP work. And after I finish the CP work, I then go to while loop and check whether the coroutine is done. If it is not done, I go coro.resume. And when I resume, um, I will go this while loop and check the status again, and so on and so forth. So there <coughs> is an overlap between CP work and GPU work here. Right? I call GPU work. And then I go to execute the GPU matrix mitigation. And now call call wait, suspend the coroutine, go back to the main function, executing the CPU work. There's an overlap. That means we can reduce the runtime. And that's the powerfulness of coroutine. Coroutine gives you an ability to suspend the coroutine and then go to resume another coroutine, for example. Before I move on to C++ coroutine cor components, is there any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, I also have a question about the last resume at the end, right? When you resume, yes. is, what, um, is it going to basically block until your coroutine completes, or is it going to block until your coroutine suspends itself again? So when you call coro.resume, cor you'll go to this call wait, uh, the next line of call wait. And you'll go to this while loop. And if the status of string is not success, you'll call it again. And then go back to here, and you'll check whether coroutine is done. Oh, because it's a while. Sorry, I didn't see that. Sorry. Yes, Sorry. it's like event-driven approach. Yes. So the code isn't necessarily equivalent. The coroutine will go in a, a spinning loop, right? You'll, yeah. You know, you burn the CPU <coughs> while the one on the left, it might actually do a sleep, right? Exactly. So uh, this is what we call like polling approach, uh, event-driven approach. You will keep polling the status of a CUDA stream. Another approach you can do is to callback. 
you call a callback, you insert a callback, and when the <coughs> status is cool out success, you'll call this callback, and the callback will, uh, for example, enqueue another skate uh, into another task. Yeah. So this is uh, just an example. Yeah, I guess you probably answer my question. So uh, can we do that? Because a uh, CUDA launch can be asynchronous. We can also check the results in a separate function. Would that be? You mean for with our coroutine? Yeah, um, without a coroutine implementation, oh. we can also do like CUDA async launch. Yes, I was expecting someone asking that. So actually what we can do, uh, your, to answer your question, surely, yes. In this example, example, you can do this. Without coroutine, you still can get overlap between CPU work and GPU work. So what you can do is to like move these two lines to another function, for example. And then in the main function, you can still do GPU work, and then CPU work, and finally synchronize. That's your, your answer, right? Yeah. OK. Uh, uh, I haven't finished yet, sorry. So. Um, Without protein, in this simple example, you can still do this. You can still overlap. But what if you have more tasks? What if you have dependencies between tasks? Suppose you have a task <coughs> dependency graph. <coughs> and in this task dependency graph, once, uh, the solution is to have some synchronized task right, inside the task dependency graph. When the scheduler schedule your task dependency graph, at some point, when you enter into this task, you are synchronized. And that means you are busy looping. And when you go into this single function, this synchronized task, there is no ability for you to jump off this task. So you will keep busy looping. Because you don't have the ability to suspend this, code, uh, suspend this task and then go back to another task. But if you are using coroutine, what you can do is to, OK, I suspend this task. And then I go to another task. And it's like schedule assign you another coroutine task for you so that you can overlap. Another point of view is that without coroutine, it's much less expressive because you always need to split the function to two tasks. With coroutine, everything is together. This is a GPU work, and this is the task. It's much more expressive. Um, any question so far? Yeah. So the last slide looks like a blocking waiter. You mean this yeah, part? This one. Okay. Is, is it possible to write it without a manual loop? Manual. Uh, like manual while loop. Like, so yeah, so I think so he's so looking for just like an await function yeah. on here. Curl dot await. Yes. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> you can <laughs> actually write this in somehow inside your scheduler. And you just keep looping, and then until you just finish the work. It depends on your, how you implement your scheduler or coroutine. Okay. All right, that's the motivation. Any question? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> General question, maybe you'll answer, but I want to put it in. So, you know, the, the other kind of general solution to the problem of like GPU work and CPU work is you have dedicated GPU threads that just feed GPU with work and they wait and whatever, and then you have the, the rest is the CPU threads and when the CPU wants to know if GPU work is done, it asks the GPU thread, you know, do you have some results for me? Yes. And yeah, there is like queue, you know, yeah. in and out. And that basically runs itself and GPU threads only talk to GPU and they exchange to the queue and that thing pretty much runs itself. Exactly, yeah. So. Do coroutines give you any advantage over right. that approach? Yeah, yes. And depends on your, imp your implementation, you can do either this kind of polling best or you can use callback method. It's all doable. Yeah? Can you send like a coroutine to threads? Send a coroutine to task? Between, Between threads. threads. Between threads, yes. So coroutine is just a function. <coughs> it has a more ability because um, it has one more ability to like suspend and jump back to the caller. So it has a stack. It's, it it yeah. has no concept of scheduler. You can implement your scheduler. Question. If if your code function jump between multiple threads, yes. 
water quality is very local. Right? It will be stored in the protein state. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is it like a state machine or like a stack full? It's stateless. C++ so protein is stateless. Stateless, so it has a stack. So it is a state issue. Yeah. But I think to the question of thread locals, you would actually lose the, the thread. I mean, they have to take different values once you have the reactor yeah, on the thread. Yeah, but I'm thinking about it. That if you have a local in this thread, and you jump into our thread, and you access it actually to a local It thread, will get the will value, get value of that thread, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because basically thread yeah. local is essentially like a pointer to yeah, a right. giant mm -hmm. table yes. indexed yeah. by thread ID, right. conceptually. So your thread ID will change, oh, yeah. and you will get a different slot of the giant table. Right. I, I think that's yeah, how yeah, it should work. Right? Let's uh, move on. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to dive into four components of Coroutine. Um, C++ 20 is a very important and huge update for me. It contains lots of major changes, and even changed the way we write code. One of the most important features of C++ 20 is that it introduced coroutines. While coroutine concept is simple, when, I read, when we read about the C++ coroutine, it's not easy, right? Um, it's there, are less, there are lots of customization points, and it's not that straightforward. More importantly, there are lack of libraries or examples online. Um, for example, in C++20, we don't have standard lib uh, scheduling library for C++ coroutines for now. Even though you can write coroutines, you still somehow need to implement your scheduler. So later in this talk, <coughs> I'll give you a concrete example about how I write a coroutine, uh, how I write a scheduler for coroutines. But before we dive into example, I want to go through the four components of C++ coroutines. The first one is, of course, coroutines. And the second one is promise. This promise is not standard stood promise. This is coroutine promise. And I have a wait ball, and finally I will talk about coroutine handle. So coroutine, how to define a coroutine? This is an example I showed you in previous slide, GP work. How do I know this is a coroutine? There are two conditions. First one is that inside your coroutine, you need to use one of three keywords, co-weight, co-yield, or co-return. So here in line 11, I have co-weight, that means this function will be considered as coroutine. And the second is that I need to return a coroutine object. Let's specify a promise. I'll talk about it later. All you need to know for now is that first, co-weight. And here, I need to return a coroutine object. In this talk, I'll mainly use co-weight. Co-yield and co-return is, for me, simply a variant of co-weight. Once you know how to use co weights, you will know how to use co yield and co return. <coughs> okay, so how to define a coroutine class? This is a coroutine class I define myself. I name it coral. The most important part is here the coroutine has, class must define this promise underscore type. I'll go through each function later because this is promise type. But right now, all you need to know is that this coroutine class must define this promise underscore type. And that's coroutine. OK, any questions so far? So promise. Promise controls coroutine behavior. It controls the suspension of beginning and end of the coroutine. It also controls how you create the return object, the coroutine object, and also the exception handling, like um, how to handle the exception during the execution <coughs> of coroutine. So promise controls coroutine's behavior. So this is the previous example I showed you before. 
Inside this coroutine class, I have this promise type. And I have several functions here. And the initial suspend is to determine the suspension of beginning of coroutine, like whether you want to suspend at the beginning of the coroutine when you call this coroutine. Suspension always the return. Okay. So suspending means uh, when you call this function, if it's uh, like this is uh, suspendable, then you go back to the caller. Yes. Okay. Immediately go back to. It. Yeah. So uh, the return type is a weatherball, which I also will talk about it later. But here is to define the suspension of beginning of the coroutine, and the final suspend is similar. Is that that. It defines the end of the coroutine. So you can determine whether you want to suspend or resume and when you are at the end of the coroutine. Mm -hmm. Is suspend always the only type you can return, or the, or the suspend underscore thing? Suspend always? Is that the only type you can return? This is a waitable. Yeah. You so can define your. You can return other uh, uh, right? Yes. You can define your customer uh, awaitable. So and this is a building available. So is there like a suspend yes. not or never. suspend never? never? Suspend never. Another okay. building available. Okay, thanks. <coughs> and the get return object is to create this coroutine. So you can see the return type is coral, which is the same here. And on handle exception is to define how you handle the exception. So I know. Um, Promise type is so complicated. And why suddenly we need to define lots of things? Let's pull it back uh, a little bit. This is GPU work, and this is a coroutine. I see there is a call wait and suspend always, which is a building available. And the return type is coral. Why do we need to define promise? I don't even see the word promise here. Now let's see what compiler sees. So actually, when you write your coroutine, what compiler sees your code is a little bit different as shown on the button right here. It's a simplified version, but now you know why you need promise and its corresponding functions. So first, in your coroutine, the compiler will add these two lines. You will create a promise type, and then you will call get return object. That's why you need to define get return object. Otherwise, you will get compile error because there's no definition here. That's why. Another part is here. Inside the coroutine, compile at least lines, try and catch block. And inside catch section, <coughs> you will call <coughs> unhandle exception. That's why, again, you need to define unhandle exception. And the most important part is this coroutine body. Before we go into this coroutine body, compiler will add this line, p the initial suspend, to determine whether you want to suspend at the beginning of the coroutine. And finally, we got final suspend at the end of the coroutine. Also, it's to determine whether you want to suspend at the end of the coroutine. So you can see why we need to define promise. Mm -hmm. And promise really controls behaviors of coroutine like the beginning and the end of the coroutine, and also uh, handle the exception. So that's why. And that is promise. Before I move on, yeah. Uh, I, I just have a question. So why does a coroutine almost always want to suspend at the beginning? Like, like why, why, why this is a, a thing? You need initial suspend? Yeah. Um, in my later example, I always use suspend voice, and then I'll give you the reason. Okay. Yeah. So in your example, actually, the GPU work will, when the, when the function is executed, it will first uh, you will call that p initial suspend, so that function gets suspended back. Yes, exactly. But when it when it get a resume back to the function, the caller will resume. So oh. it's yeah. Okay. Default uh, caller's responsibility. Okay. Yeah. So. No, my, my question is uh, so when you go back, the, the, the light save and call await, you suspend, then you go back to your caller, right? Yes. I mean, that's uh, your main function. 
yeah. then when that uh, the line eight could a string uh, get distributed? Reason when you call resume again. So the main function we call resume. <coughs> yes. Doesn't so doesn't that make your example not work properly? I will because give you it's going to suspend initially, uh -huh. then do the CPU work, then resume at that point and we'll do the matrix multiplier yeah. for the GPU. Actually, I'm not sure it actually suspends. Didn't your suspend have nothing in it so it doesn't really suspend? No, but uh, the return, return time is suspend, suspend always. Yeah. Which okay. Return okay. Return always it will suspend immediately. Okay. Uh, yeah. It will enter and immediately exit before doing anything. Okay. Yeah. So basically if you return type uh is suspend always. That means just create a coroutine and just mm -hmm. do nothing. Yeah, in your case, uh, it, it will exist as a GPU work to main function, then continue CPU work, right? Uh, yeah, that's another example. Um, uh, that's the same example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I'm wondering because if you if you get back to the main function, then that's uh, actually GPU work and the CPU work not the extra overlap. Yes, yes. So uh, let me go back to a. Uh, Here's a slide. Uh, here? You mean here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, because there's a. Yeah, so re if the return type is suspend always, you need to add corolla resume between line 19 and 19. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So here you can see it's like uh, the return type is suspend never. I see. Okay. Well, alternatively, in your promise, you could have had a return type be. Suspend never. Yes. Yeah. And then that yeah, code. Do this work. Then yeah. that code would be correct. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Well, this is basically Sorry about a generator. The of this core weight is basically like co yield nothing and I mean co yield ignore. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is basically a generator. Mm -hmm. So then generators are typically suspend never on entrance. They go to the first co yield. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, along the same line, the final suspend, I think you define it as if to return suspend. Suspend always. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too clear about what's happening then at the end of your coroutine when you when you reach that line. Does it mean that it's not completed yet? Yes. Uh, and so you need to call resume again to just get to the next line, which is the end of the recording. Yeah, and the coroutine will be destroyed. And so, and why would one someone want to do that at the end of a coroutine <coughs> to return? As the final suspend to it return offers you the flexibility, right? That's why C++ yeah. coding is so complicated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my the reason is you keep the state. Yeah. Because as soon as you fall out of the bottom, the state is destroyed. So yeah, but this is in this case, this is the final suspend is at the end of the coding. So I'm curious about why would you want to return suspend always when you when you are at the end of your coding? Well, you might have the results from the GPU still sitting there and be available to the Yeah, that's, to that's the right. right. Yeah. You don't want everything you destroyed. Want <laughs> yeah, destroyed. Yeah, you want that. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Any questions so far? Okay, um, that's the promise. <coughs> Thanks, Will Enzo. Um, okay, where am I? So the next thing is Awaitable. <coughs> Awaitable controls a specific suspension point behavior. So when you see this call wait, what does that mean? Should I always suspend? Or maybe I can, based on my applications, there must be some conditions we can use, maybe. And based on the conditions, we probably don't need to suspend the coroutine, and we can directly resume. In this case, I can reduce the overhead. You don't need to go back, you don't need to bundle the coroutine state and then suspend and go back to the caller. Sometimes I just want to directly resume because I meet some conditions. And that's what Awaitable does. Awaitable controls a specific <coughs> suspension point behavior. How to define an Awaitable? To define an awaitable, you need to define three things. Away ready, away suspend, and away resume. Um, by more strict definition, awaitable is to provide you a operator call wait. And it is a waiter that need to define these three fun uh, functions. But it's so similar, so in this talk, I'll all use awaitable. So awaitable needs to de define these three functions. 
we're ready, or we suspend, and we resume. So here, line seven, actually what compiler sees is from, it will change from seven, line seven to line 13 to line 19. So first, you will declare a waiter, and then you will call a waiter dot aware ready. If aware ready returns false, again, this is why you need to define aware ready. Otherwise, you'll get a compile error. So when the aware ready is false, you'll go to await suspend to determine whether you want to suspend or resume. You can define whether you want to def uh, suspend or resume inside await suspend. And after that, when you resume, you'll call await resume. <coughs> and here is the building awaitable. Still library provides you two building awaitables, suspend never and suspend always. So here I use call wait suspend always in line seven. So here I declare <coughs> a waiter as suspend always. And I'll go into this await ready. Based on the definition, suspend always always return false. That means I always go to suspend function. When I execute the await suspend, it does nothing, but it return void. And what it means is always suspend, no matter what. If a return type of await suspend is void, <coughs> sorry, void, that means I always suspend. That's why the name is suspend always. And away resume simply does nothing. There are variants of away suspend. The first one we just talked about is to return void. That means I always suspend and return back to the caller. The second is to return bool. So if I return true, I suspend. If not, I directly resume this coroutine. The third variant is a return coroutine handle. That's what we call symmetric coroutine transfer for anyone in the know. What it means is that I suspend my current coroutine and then I will resume directly the returned coroutine here. So I'll suspend the current coroutine and then I'll resume the return coroutine. So you don't need to go back to the caller. Yes. So if I run a function returns a bool, but I just return true always, is it the same as re return the void? Um, not really. So you can see suspend always in your away ready, you return false. So you don't need to go into this if section. No, no, sorry. I mean, await suspend. Uh huh. So await suspend is void, yeah. Yeah, so if I write a function, if I write a with suspend that always return true, is it the same as yes, yeah, yeah. return void? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> right? If it's const if it's in constex per way always returns true, then yes. If it's at runtime always returns true, then you will actually test it. Okay. And then yeah. and, and yeah. then do the same thing anyway. Okay. But if it's constex per true, uh, yeah. it's basically like this is, you know, the, 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 the compiler implementation there would basically be like if the return type is void or we can figure out that it's true, yeah, do the same uh, thing. Okay. It's like the return type is true or you can determine in long time. Yeah. Is there any way to, um, I guess, like, uh, from the perspective of like writing a scheduler, is there a way to like hook into this logic outside of the Routine. Outside of the coroutine? <coughs> so uh, yeah. Test it. So this is, um, you can customize, always customize your available anywhere. Yeah. So instead of uh, co awaiting suspend never, I could, uh, or suspend always, I could co await a different uh, awaitable mm -hmm. that will have its own logic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to echo here, so I have. So there's a final suspend, right? Uh, typically, what most 
schedule library does is to write your own final awaitable. And inside of final awaitable, you can do some clearing and then enqueue the next successor task, for example. So you can always define your. Right. So that's avoidable. Here's a little wrap up. Promise controls coroutine's behavior, like beginning and end of the coroutine, and also does extension handling. Avoidable controls specific suspension point behavior. For example, when I see code wait suspend always, I immediately know that the coroutine will suspend and go back to the code. <coughs> So to really understand promise and avoidable, you really need to know how it compares your coroutine. So the final piece is coroutine handle. Um, turns out it's the easiest one. Uh, it's just like a pointer to the coroutine. And what you can do is to access promise and coroutine via coroutine handle. So this, this middle graph is coroutine handle. What you can do is to call promise, and you'll get a promise. And student library also provide from promise, so you can tag the promise as argument, and then go back to the coding handle. On the other side, you can call handle.address to get the row pointer. It's like C style programming. And then you can also use from address and tag the row pointer to get back to the coding handle. Coroutine handle text promise as template. There's a specialization which, uh, which is coroutine handle void or erase type. And what it means is that it basically can represent any coroutine handle with any promise template. However, you lost the ability to use handle.promise, like this part, because compiler don't know which promise type you are referring to. Another useful functions in coroutine handle are resume, to resume the coroutine. Down, to check if the coroutine has completed. Destroy, destroy the handle. And that's the coroutine handle. All right? Now I wanna demonstrate how I implement a scheduler. So first one is single 30. Yeah. I'm sorry, just one more. So why, why do we need, need to explicitly destroy a coroutine? Uh, actually, you don't. So when you call destroy, it's like you are calling a destructor. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So you, you don't really need to call it destroy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes no, there are code genes that are infinite loops, but uh, we only uh, resume them several times, and then we just destroy oh, them. Oh, I see. Okay. The, the handle is not an RII object. Handle going out of scope doesn't delete anything. Okay. So if the handle goes out of scope and you didn't call destroy, that's it, you leak it. No, but, but the coroutine itself can, can just end, right? Right, after executing end, the coroutine. But like if you suspend it on the final suspend and never resume, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because you're holding the data. Right. But if I resume, do I still have to call it destroy? No, one way or the other. Either you call through the bottom or destroy oh. gets called. Yeah, like. And if you do both, it's basically it's like double three. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you need to ensure, if you don't use destroy, you need to ensure this coroutine will fully execute it. Just like a function. Okay. Yeah. Would this be just like in like some mechanism where you're doing like multiple like jobs and you want to wait the first one that completes? Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. It depends you can on destroy schedule. the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> All right, single thirty. Before I dive into schedule implementation, let's talk about what coroutine test I want to schedule first. So the code shown on the left are uh, two <coughs> coroutine tasks. This is task A, and you take scheduler as argument. And inside this test A, I will print out hello from test A. And then I will do call wait, suspend. And this suspend simply returns suspend always. So I always suspend and go back to the caller. <coughs> and when I resume it, I will print out executing the test A, and then suspend again. And finally, print out test A is finished. Test B is the same, it says that I print out test B, except test A. Okay. 
and this is my main function. I will declare a scheduler. And I'll use impress to impress the coroutine handle back to the scheduler. So test A is a coroutine. I'll use get handle to get the coroutine handle. So you need to define a get handle inside your coroutine class. So what it means is that I return this coroutine handle and hang it back to a scheduler for later scheduling. And I print out start scheduling. And finally, I call a schedule function to schedule coroutines. Sorry, is, is it, isn't the lifetime of your coroutine attached to the <coughs> task object? Uh, sorry, again? It is, is the lifetime of your coroutine not attached to the task object that's returned? Mm, yeah, inside, I mean, inside my schedule, I'll ensure that this coroutine is finished. Right, but when you call like task A, right, you're calling a function that returns a coroutine object. Like a temporary. A temporary. Yeah. Right, yep. then you call an ember function on it, which returns a void mm, point. Yes. And then after that, the return value is destroyed. Uh huh. Right, so if the lifetime of your returned task not tied to the coroutine, not tied to the coroutine. But the task is value is destroyed. Is the coroutine destroyed? No, 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 no. So it's still yep. in the stack. I see. And then and it's not stacking. It's stack. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. state machine object <coughs> yes. is not a, actually it's, its lifetime is not attached to return value. Its lifetime is arbitrary. Yeah, the, the, the task is the uh, is a promise, right? So it's all always comes with the coroutine. But even a promise mm -hmm. in the standard sense, it has a you know, an object which is associated with lifetime, and maybe you destroy that. The lifetime of the promise itself is the same as the coroutine, and the only yeah. way to end it is to destroy it. Your reference to the promise, which you get through the return object, may disappear, in which case you wouldn't be able to, like, resume the coroutine or do anything with the coroutine, but the, cor the coroutine frame itself must be explicitly destroyed by falling through the bottom or calling destroy it. Mm -hmm. so so if I understand correctly, that implies that a heap allocation is required whenever you... The frame is on the heap. Okay. I mean, the compilers play games, but conceptually, yeah. the frame is always on the heap. Okay, that, that, that answered another question. Thank you. Yeah, great. So in line 25, uh, a, a coroutine frame and a promise were allocated on the heap. Yeah, and, I don't do it uh, default. And uh, task A, or, or task object was created as a temporary return object. Uh -huh. And then when we move to line 26, um, the promise and the coroutine frame remain on the heap. Yes. And does the task object uh, still remain somewhere? Yeah. Or is that, is it, so where, where does it remain? Uh, I mean, is it like a lifetime experience? Yeah, you can say it's just destroyed. So, okay. yeah, okay. only the coroutine. And the promise is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. This kind of brings up uh, the kind of worms, right? <clears throat> We've already gone through the whole life cycle of you know, like creating objects on the heap and then forgetting to destroy them. <laughs> <laughs> the memory leaks are incredible when you do <laughs> oh, <I imagine>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah. So in the schedule, I will make sure I'll guarantee that all the core things are finished. Yeah. So it got destroyed. Okay. And this is the definition of the coroutine and the promise type. I name it as task. The first part is here. So I store a handle and I use get handle to return a handle. The second part is the promise type. Here, um, the return of initial suspend and final suspend are all suspend always, meaning that I always suspend at the beginning <coughs> and end of the coroutine. That's because I want to hand the execution over to the scheduler. Mm. So if we go back to the main function um, on the right side here, I call the coroutine test A, test B in line 12, 25 and 26. But at this moment, since the initial suspend <coughs> returns suspend always, I only create these coroutines and do not execute them. And I use get handle to get the coroutine handle back to the scheduler for later scheduling. Okay, clear? <coughs> so, 
So it's like up to scheduler can schedule task B first. Yes, oh, exactly. Yeah. I'll go through the example later. Uh, okay. So get return object simply use from promise, and then to get a handle, and then you will use this handle to create a task. And then return void unhandle assumption simply do nothing in my scheduler implementation. This is the scheduler implementation. On the left hand side is the scheduler, and on the right side is the main function for you to take a reference. So first part is here. I have a test queue stores curtain handles. And for the impress, simply input the test handle, the curtain handle, back to the test queue. The schedule function. I'll keep iterating this test queue to check whether there's a task inside the test queue. If it is not empty, I'll grab one of the tasks and resume it. After I resume it, I'll check whether the task is done. If it is not done, I'll push it back to the end of the test queue. And that's the scheduler. So I'll keep iterating until the test queue is empty. Yeah, go sure. And if, in the, if it is done, you need to destroy it. No, if it's done. It's, it's done itself at the bottom. Yeah. No. It destroys itself. Well, mm -hmm. like, okay, so, so does, so what, if yeah. you reach final suspend, final suspend, well, suspend, return always. suspend always. Yes, I know it's true. Is it done still return false? No. Well, after you execute the final suspend, the down will be true. Mm. And the okay. frame will. Right. And then you'll. But yeah, we use saving it so the uh, done will be false when you hit that final suspend. Yes. It won't be true until afterwards, right? Yeah. But yeah. you can't call it. I mean, you, you, like, you can't find out because like, you're hitting final suspend from inside of the core team. There is no place in between there where you can observe the change. I guess from. Fi well, no. Once you're inside final suspend, that's it, you're done. Right. Yeah, but what is the value of done uh, when you hit final suspend? That's the question, I guess, right? When you reach final suspend, well, you can't know. I mean, the, the first time you can check it, it will be through. Yeah, when you reach final suspend, it won't be done, so it'll get pushed to the thing, right? And then. Um, yeah. To be more clear, the return type of final suspend is suspend always. So <coughs> after I call the final suspend, I will suspend. So done. Turns to true. Yes. The frame is not yet destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. mm. uh, in this in a destructor of a schedule, you can write something, reason or every test. It depends on your schedule. Yeah, because this leaks this leaks all the frames because mm -hmm. you, yeah. you you oh, never yeah. resume okay. on after the final suspend. Yeah. So you don't let it fall to the bottom, mm -hmm. and you don't okay. basically destroy it. Somewhere there needs to be destroyed. Did you show the implementation of done anywhere? Sorry, what? Did you show the implementation of um, the done? Yeah. Done is a building it's function it's inside, inside okay. the coding handle. Okay. So to follow up, if the final suspend return, suspend never, um, it will be dangerous because when I resume it, I directly destroy the coding because it's finished. When you check test the done, it's undefined behavior. So actually, that's why I use suspend always. Are you sure that's true? <coughs> the handle is, uh, I mean, you're calling done on the handle. So the handle is not pointing to the core team. I'm sure that done is true. So, uh, the, the, the time the table, sorry. yeah, um, if I return suspend never, right? And I resume it. So that means I, add, I finish this core team, and this core team is destroyed. And when I call test that done, this core team is destroyed. So done will return. On the high, a defined behavior. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 You're right. Okay. Good. Okay. So in this example, um, we're basically letting the tasks like suspend themselves, and like in theory, a task can take like arbitrarily long before suspending out. Yeah. So in this case, would it just like stall out the scheduler? 
or like I guess a better way to phrase it is: Does the scheduler have any way to like force this suspension? No, no, okay. no. It depends on how you write your coroutine. Yes. So to prevent, I guess this is following up on what you were talking about. To prevent the leak of the tasks in the like, what what would we have to do there to prevent the leak of the of the coroutine frames? You have to pull handle destroy it. Okay. Um, what you can do is, for example, for the destructor of the schedule, you can like resume everyone. It's just okay. get it down. I see. So would we then have like a different vector of like tasks that are like completed, and then uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once it's right. like actually then we push it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or we could just like call like the handle destroy. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it all depends on how you implement. Okay. Yeah, usually we call can handle this word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can have a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Okay. okay. These are stack frames. So, like in theory, you know, if you're calling other functions, you know, could be like, you know, whatever you like a normal stack, two megabyte stack frames. You know, the compiler will optimize, but if you're calling other stuff, it could be big. Right. Yeah, but if you, if you call destroyer, you're not then never getting to the final suspend code. If you call destroy before calling final suspend, you will never get to the final suspend. That's right. You can call destroy at any time. You could, like, as soon as it's called, wait until right, it's right. And instead of resuming it, just say destroy, and it will never resume. But yeah, that seems dangerous if you're depending, if your promise is depending on final suspend doing something useful, right? Um, yeah. There's, there's, there's letting things ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's still lots of stuff going on, sorry. Uh, so, so let me move on. Um, Let's execute this program first and then see the result. So when I execute in this program, I'll print out start scheduling. And I'll say, hello, from test A. And what's next? Test, test B, B is finished. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no. OK, so the next is hello, from test A, yeah. uh, test B. Right. And the next will be execute. Uh, since this is a single threaded scheduler, the result are deterministic, <laughs> right? Sure. So what if I change <clears throat> the test queue to stack? Now let's get the result again. So first, start scheduling. And what's next? Hello for test Hello B. For test B. Right, exactly. Because test B is the last inserted task. I impress test A first and test B. And the next is executing test B. Right. Yeah. Executing the test B, test B is finished, and then test A. So if we change test Q to test deck, it becomes like what a normal function does. Mm. We first executing test B, and test B is finished, we go to test A. So you can see the execution of coroutine is very flexible. It depends on how you implement your scheduler. So I need to speed up a little bit. Um, Multi-threaded scheduler. I change from single-threaded to multi-threaded. There shouldn't be difference for coroutine test, right? There shouldn't be any modification for the user code. So the coroutine test is exactly the same. For the main function, it's almost the same is that I have a wait. It's like to wait until all threads to join the main thread. All right, so it's almost the same. <coughs> How about the coroutine and promise type? <coughs> there, sh there shouldn't be difference for task. I only change the scheduler again from single threaded to multiple threaded, multi threaded. I can still use the same definition of coroutine and promise type. So I still want to return suspend always at the beginning to hand the execution over the scheduler. So this is exactly the same as single threaded version. The most important part of multi-threaded scheduler is its member variables and functions. So here I have two private member functions, in queue and process. In queue is to insert a task for execution. Process is to return the task, which I'll talk about the details later. I have two data structures to store tasks. The first one is a vector of tasks. <coughs> when user impress a task, I will impress a task to this task vector. The second one is task queue. 
that's where we're scheduling the task. The pending task, the task queue, will keep pushing and popping by the scheduler. I use two separate data structure to make things more clear. All right? And this is a vector of that. And I use mutex condition the variable to block on the users. In C++ 20, um, there is atomic weight. You can use that, but right now I use condition variable. I have a stop signal to signal whether threads need to return. And I also have an atomic finish to count finish tasks. Right? So this is my implementation of multi-study scheduler. I use simple centralized queue, which is pending task. So inside this constructor, I will take an argument, number of threads, meaning that how many threads I want to use in this scheduler. I will iteratively insert a thread in workers. Each thread will execute a lambda. Inside lambda, first, we'll go to infinite loop and create an empty query handle, empty handle. I'll then go into this critical section protected by a lock. We then check the predicate using condition variable, CV. So if a predicate, these conditions return true, we don't block the thread. We'll keep working on uh, checking the if stop. Otherwise, we need to block until some thread notify us, notify this thread. So when I go to line 66, that means this predicate is true. So one of the conditions is true, or two, two conditions is true. So I'll first check whether stop is true. If it is true, that means someone toggle a stop to true. And that means all the tests are finished. If stop is not true, that means pending test queue is not empty. So I grab one task. And then finally, I'll do process. Inside the process, I will resume the task. And that's the multi-thread scheduler. So does anyone implement, did anyone implement the scheduler for functions before? When you look at this, multi-thread scheduler. The only difference is the test type. <coughs> what you can do thank you, is to, for example, if I want to schedule functions, it's like you change the test type to still function, uh, pointer. And you can still use this scheduler and schedule your functions. Mm. So actually, that's the only difference. So it's not that difficult to implement your scheduler for coroutines. And that's the process function. Inside the process function, I'll resume it. And I'll check whether it is done. If it is not, enqueue it back to the test queue. Otherwise, this test is finished. So I'll uh, fetch add finished, increment this finished by one, and check whether the value is the same as test vector. If it is the same, I toggle the stuff to true. Notify everyone to join back to the main thread. For the enqueue, I enqueue a task and notify one of the worker to execute this coroutine. And the pending test is protected by a lock. And that's our mod test threaded scheduler. And these are some oil play functions inside the impress. I impress back a task back to the task vector. And for the schedule function, I iterate all the tasks, push it back to the pending test queue. For the wait function, iterate if we uh, call a join to wait until all the threads to join. Right, I'm um, gonna move on to CPU, GPU scheduler. Right, so like right now I want to have some GPU computing. That means we have GPU kernels for our coroutine test. 
And here we define a GPU work as our GPU kernels. So the keyword global means it's a CUDA keyword, means you want to execute these functions on the GPU. And inside GPU work, do some GPU work. In the test A, again, um, I use CUDA for programming GPU code. To overload the kernel, you need to create a stream first. And then you execute this GPU kernel. That means you include this kernel to this stream queue. So if this GPU work is expensive, it's like better to contest switch to another thread. And then but to, to another task, for example, test B, so then we can overlap CPU and GPU computing. So here I will go to the while loop and check the status of stream. And then if it is not success, I will call call wait, suspend the coroutine, go back and ask scheduler to assign another task. And if the status is success, print out test A is finished, destroy the stream. Main function, still the same. Declare a scheduler, impress a coding handle back to a scheduler. Print out, start scheduling, executing schedule function, and then wait. How about the scheduler implementation? CPU, GPU implementation. Turns out there is no need of another scheduler implementation. You can directly embed your multi-thread scheduler inside this kind of CPU GPU workload. The reason is because inside this test A, <coughs> I only use this while loop, and all I need to do is to call call wait, suspend, to suspend this coroutine. And then the schedule resume again. There's no CUDA APIs I need inside our schedule implementation. So you can directly embed your multi-thread scheduler for this workload. Ooh, uh, congrats. Right now you know how to <laughs> implement a scheduler. Yeah. Um, finally, I want to spend some time to show some uh, experimental results. I will do a performance comparison between. OK, go ahead. Uh, I have a quick question about the previous slide. Um, maybe I missed this, but does what exactly does CUDA stream query do? Does it shoot up like an async operation? Or you mean this create? Uh, no, the line 22. Line 22. Query. Yeah. So uh, I'll execute this GPU kernel, include this to stream, and the GPU, work, GPU will start to work. And the query is to query whether the stream is success. If it is success, that means this GPU work is finished. So this is like to check the status of the stream. So wouldn't that line block until the GPU completed all of its work? Or? Um, no. So all, all of the GPU kernel is launched asynchronously. So uh, when you call the GPU work, GPU will start to work. And then you go to this line, string security. And query is a, a synchronous call. So you just check, you, you just pull in the status of the stream. OK, but if that returns true, or if it's success, then you immediately go to the task is finished. Yes. But at that point, the GPU task is not necessarily completed yet. Uh, why? Uh, when, the state, when you check the status of a query, uh, when you query a status of stream, if it returns CUDA success, that means this GPU work is finished. And oh, you mean like I should I shouldn't say test A is finished. I should say <coughs> GPU work is finished. Is that what you mean? Or because you're saying that like that line basically just shoots off like GPU work and then tells you whether or not it successfully started. Uh -huh. Then wouldn't you reach line twenty six before the GPU? So if the GPU work is finished, I'll I immediately go to this line. I think uh, the 920 actually just submit a job to the GPU card. Yeah, it's oh, a synchronous call. Yeah. Oh, it's a synchronous call. Okay, I yeah. see, I see. I already submitted it. <laughs> right? It varies the schedule on the CPU GPU benchmark. Um, so uh, the code shown on the above of the slide uh, is a task for without coroutine task, without coroutine scheduler. Inside this without coroutine scheduler uh, work, I'll call <coughs> CPU loop. This CPU loop is to simulate something uh, takes a while, 
in a real situation. Here, the argument takes CPU log milliseconds for simplicity. Mm -hmm. So after the CPU log, uh, I will create a stream as a CUDA loop, um, and then synchronize stream, destroy the stream. And this is the test for without coroutine scheduler. And I'll in impress hundreds of these tests and measure the performance. And all the tests are independent. And this is the test for with coroutine scheduler. It's, it's that the same. It's that, that I change from synchronized to this while loop to that, uh, to that coroutine to suspend and then go on to another task. And I'll impress hundreds of tests here for with coroutine scheduler and measure performance. This is the hardware platform I use. I use four CPU threads, each of 3.6 gigahertz. On the CPU side, I got 32 gigabytes memory. And I use one NVIDIA 2080 Ti GPU. For the compiler, I use CUDA version 12 to compile GPU code. And for the, GPOS, uh, for the CPU code, I use GPOS version 12. And I enable all three for optimization flag. I'll do a performance comparison between scheduler with without using coroutine. And here is the runtime over different number of tasks. Here I run four tasks, and each task has one CPU loop and one CUDA loop for roughly 10 milliseconds. And you can see without coroutine is a bit better than with coroutine because we only use four tasks. We only schedule four tests. We got four threads. So the take home message I want to show you is that, yes, there's a certain cost of using coroutine because you need to bundle the coroutine state, suspend it, resume by caller. There must be a cost. But you can see the cost is really tiny. How about we change from the number of tests to six, 16? I start can see the speed up by 1.2 times, 1.2 times. How about 64 times? I can see 1.6 times speed up. And finally, 256 times. I see 1.9 times speed up. Because more times means you have more chance to overlap CPU work and GPU work. That's why um, this the powerfulness of coroutine. <coughs> yes? You use the single thread scheduler? Okay. Full thread. I use multi thread scheduler. I use full thread. Yes? Well, without coroutine, you're using a single thread, right? Without coroutine, I still use full thread. I have a, a full thread scheduler inside my repo, so you can take a look. However, like uh, if I understood correctly the implementation of your scheduler, uh, you are pretty much creating, but every time the task completes, you are, or, or you start and then completes, you are creating and destroying your thread, right? So that, that is also adding a lot of overhead. Mm -hmm. so I, I didn't no. destroy the yeah, thread. thread Persistent well, the whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the task, if you create a new thread, okay, no, the thread is alive within the scheduler. So yeah, maybe that's what I misunderstood. Okay, yeah. the thread stays uh, up uh, in the scheduler, then uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, my implementation is like I have a thread pool and I'll yeah. keep- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That I, I, I misunderstood the, the way that's going. Okay. And this is the final one. In the closing, we have presented what is coroutine. And we also understand the motivation behind coroutine. Coroutine is very useful for heterogeneous computing. And we have presented four components of coroutine. And then I, will, I show you three scheduler implementations single threaded, multi threaded, CPU, GPU implementations, which is also shown in the uh, GitHub repo I showed before. And finally, I show the performance, the powerfulness of using C++ routines. And that's all I have today. Thanks again for attending this session. Yeah. So, uh it turns out, uh, so, so in your example, the GPU function actually pr provides you some u utility to start the task asynchronously, and you can curate the status of the task at any time. So 
does it mean the coroutine is only like more useful when the when the underlying like IO task does provide those APIs? What if I have an IO that that only provides a synchronous IO API? So in that case, the, the coroutine wouldn't be very useful, right? Um, yeah, because you cannot jump off of the coroutine. So, you need to use asynchronous. Yeah, so so I think coming from this, my question is, does that also mean in order to use a coroutine, that requires some extra work on the uh, API of the underlying I/O or, or or GPU task, and is there any? Because in my understanding is it's kind of moving mm -hmm. some complexity from one place to another. Like if you're having a very simple um, IO uh, I API, then maybe you have more difficulties here. But if you like have some complex things to provide those asynchronous API there, then we can use um, coroutines here to make life easier. Yeah, but my, my, yeah, um, my, my thought is, is, is more about, are we really like gaining any like simplicity or anything from, from doing this? So based my understanding, almost when you are, when you are using other computing resource, they somehow provide you some asynchronous APIs. Right. For example, CUDA not only have this kind of query method, you know, it also give you a call, callback method. Yeah, but, but if you imagine how they might have been implemented, that might have like some threads, or, or, or some extra cost up under the hood for, for them to have that API. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, I guess my, my confusion is more, we are kind of pushing some complexity towards <clears throat> the, the uh, IO task APIs. To echo here, you mean like, um, when you're using other computing resource, uh, this computing resource needs to provide the asynchronous I/O, right. uh, asynchronous APIs, right. and that will give you complexity. Right. Uh, yeah, to give you answer, to use coroutine, you must provide asynchronous I/O, uh, asynchronous APIs. Okay. Otherwise, there is no way for you to jump out, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Mentioned that uh, all those uh, um, those uh, uh, I'm not sure, so promise is assigned uh, allocated on heap, right? Depends on how you implement. So, this is part of the coroutine frame, but you can override the allocator. Yes, <laughs> you can write yeah. your own yeah, you write customer okay. custom allocator, like to override a new operator. I see. Oh, okay. That's yeah, it's, it's a it's a class. So, yeah. I have a question on the benchmark comparison that I had in the last example. Like, is it like a, is any like CPU tasks and GPU tasks like running at the same time in your benchmark, where like uh, with all of the, all of those like a different number of tasks, or there's only a GPU like kind of tasks? There's no like heavy lifted like CPU tasks. Um. So I think you are asking this question. So inside this task, I have CPU work and also GPU work. So when you ask Qtin, like various numbers of this task, each task may execute CPU work, and maybe another task will execute in GPU work, and there will be overlap. Is that your question? Where's the CPU? So CPU loop. It's a function, it's a oh, false function. Sorry. Yeah. But in this case, is there a kind of dependency between the work that needs to be done on CPU and the one on, on, uh, uh, on the uh, GPU? Because I'm thinking at this point, you could uh, split uh, even CPU uh, work alone on a task and uh, uh, GPU in a separate task. So you end up using more tasks, to say, but probably you would parallelize better. Uh, Even without coordinates. It depends on how you implement your task. No, sure, yeah. The, the, the question is, uh, what is your expectation there? Like, for example, so, um, 
what I'm thinking is like uh, now you are effect. Let's see. I think the, this benchmark uh, uh, for the way I interpret it is a little bit skewed uh, on uh, emphasizing the advantage that you get with Colorbit because uh, basically, even if you schedule uh, this task on uh, four, let's say four of these tasks uh, on each specific thread, you you are effectively still executing CPU work and GPU work uh, in a serialized way. Instead, like if you would define the task without oh, CPU work on, on a task and GPU <coughs> work on another task, you can and, do that. and spawn them uh, in a parallel way, maybe we are going to see closer results or uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm just speculating, I'm trying to understand uh, okay. how much the, the way the benchmark is written uh, can influence the results that we're seeing. Yeah, so your question is like, um, it's a bit unfair for with our core team because you can split this work to two tasks, one for CPU and one for GPU. Is yeah, that your I, question? I, I, I'm, I'm wondering like, uh, would we see different results? What is uh, your experience and uh, what are the expectation? You still can get speed up. Um, like I said in the beginning, so without core routine, you need to call synchronized function. Even though you split it to two functions, two tasks. When you're executing the GPU work, you'll go to synchronize. When you enter into this synchronize, there's no way to jump out. Okay, no, okay, that's for actually what, the first part of my question, right? Like basically, you're telling me that there is a, a, a time dependence or a se sequence dependency between the work that you do on the CPU that necessarily has to complete, for example, before uh, the one on the GPU. Or anyway, no, you have some can, kind of dependency, and then you need to synchronize. And the moment you synchronize the task, so you uh -huh. lose some of the benefit and I think. I think the key here is that CUDA stream synchronize is probably just spinning in a loop, yeah. right? Burning CPU. Okay. So if you run the first one on a thread, your thread is wasted. So is your mm -hmm. CPU core, right? When you go into the core team, because you can leave, right? You do not have to spin the CPU. You can go and do some other tasks, CPU work, <laughs> yeah, while so, you wait on the GPU. So I, mm -hmm. I think that actually is my, 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 my first initial question. So I so what I take out from here is that the the speed up is actually gaining from calling a synchronous API mm -hmm. rather than calling so so it 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 it, it looks to to me that we're not gaining anything by just using code routines. We're gaining performance boost up by using asynchronous APIs and code routine just to kind of pro pro provide a way to maybe write easier or cleaner functions to utilize those asynchronous API. Yeah, that's a good way. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. so you could do what Corvette does, but do it manually and achieve roughly the same result, but it would be much yeah, yeah, so Yeah, so, so yeah, it means the, the, the performance is really just driven by asynchronous API. It, it, it is not really a, ma a magic happens when you use quarantine for everything. Oh, uh, yeah, of course, because this is a uh, Coroutine, this is a function. It's just a tool for you <coughs> to have, for example, have more expressive yeah. code. I think this is one of the things that some, sometimes called something that could potentially be a zero cost abstraction. You can make a, a code look nicer if, if you want to with a with zero performance cost. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess same, is that the same with, with lambdas? I mean, it's nothing but syntactic sugar. You could write your own right. function yeah, object and use exactly. that. Exactly. That's, what, that's what's going on here. It's just it's a little easier way of reading. Okay. And according to your talk, like C++ is zero cost, but other uh, other languages you pay a cost because because they're still on the stack. Go, for example, is that for India? Okay. okay. One, one more question about the performance. Have you looked at whether the the effect on the performance when you do the initial suspend if you return never instead of always does it affect your performance in any way? Uh, somehow, uh, uh, very tiny, you know. Yeah, very tiny. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any questions? Thank you very much. Oh, we'll talk. You go back. Um, I have, if you could go back to the uh, slide with the GP uh, job, I wonder if it makes sense. Um, that you have this Y loop in line uh, 52 and 53. If it makes sense to maybe um, extract that into its own awaiter, like. Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, um, I mean, if 
I was, if I'm a uh, scheduler developer, I will move these three lines to my schedule. Scheduler, yeah. So I will say, for example, uh, schedule that suspend. And mm. I don't need to use this kind of awful code you on the user side. Just register the stream with the, uh, with, the, with the scheduler and just yes, tell the scheduler clear. when the stream is done. Yeah. yeah. But wouldn't that break encapsulation though? I mean, then uh, you, you lose generality of the scheduler, right? Basically, mm -hmm. then you are, you are attaching your scheduler to, uh, to the purpose Jupiter. of uh, running mm -hmm. this code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> right. I wonder if there's a nice trick to have a general scheduler that also have, can work with a, a GPU awaiter mechanism or something. <laughs> could you could you perhaps like uh, write a custom promise type uh, which inherits from the scheduler's promise type? Yeah. And then have it's your a cut. methods. Oh yeah, I, I got you. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. It's another way. And the question is, why is that? Um, so the one downside I can, I can tell from mm -hmm. this is that the GPU work if it's done, and if it's a pretty latency sensitive work, and not about the GPU, probably it's not. But then if it is a pretty latency sensitive work, then um, if the CPU work takes a lot of time, more magnitude of time than the GPU work, the GPU will work will be evaluated only if there's kind of like a um, chance after CPU like work is done, there's a return to the thread to, to check that, right? So there's kind of a delay yeah. on yeah. when like to know like uh, the, the, the lightweight work is done. Uh -huh. And uh, to follow up here, I actually do some of my experiments and uh, I also do a little math here. So with some simple math and simple logic. So. I can give you some points. First, uh, the upper bound of this kind of scheduler, there is an upper bound. For example, we use only four thread. Of course, we don't get a time speed up. And the second is that if the CPU work and GPU work, the overhead is similar. You get near optimal upper bound, sure. uh, optimal speed up, because there's more chance for you to overlap. That's two points I want to give you. I would think it'd be the onus would be on you as the developer in your CPU work loop to put some suspense in there to give a chance for other things to happen. Right. If if latency of the other tasks is critical, mm -hmm. you want to do something. You, you like don't that. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. a very little chance for you to open it. Yeah. Yeah. The second question is that um, the second question is that um, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> take your time. Can we suspend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's resolve another question. Yeah. I have a resume. question meanwhile you are thinking like, um, <laughs> <laughs> let's overlap. <laughs> um, so like, it seems the sender and receiver, the, the latest, uh, the upcoming features is, uh, it's a nice feature to go in hand in hand with this. Uh, uh, these things. Uh, I wonder if we can put senders in this uh, benchmark, uh, maybe like replacing the thread pool, or would that where, where can it benefit? Um, I'm not that familiar with sender receiver because it's not published yet. But I remember <coughs> one talk yesterday or Monday. He says sender receiver can cooperate with core teams. So I, so I believe it's. It's doable, yeah. Right? <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, good question. Uh, if you remember, the, yeah, no, me, yeah. okay, the uh, <laughs> yeah, context switch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So one thing um, I'm very familiar with uh, uh, async and Rust, which is uh, reminds me a lot of core teams here. Um, in in that's. In, in Rust, I don't think you have to do a keep allocation whenever you create a coroutine function. Um, so uh, one of the things I do is I have a long call chain, right? Where I say in a function and a function and a function which calls each other, I call a wait. And um, if I were to do the same thing here with coroutines, because there's a keep allocation every time you create coroutine, right? Would that, 
if, if I understand correctly, would that mean I would have heap allocations at every level of my call chain? Um, like if I had a top level scheduler? You mean like nasty coroutine? Yeah. And when you create a coroutine, you will create a coroutine state. So, mm -hmm. well, like I said, you can use your customer allocator. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's the risk of the allocation and the compilers are allowed to optimize it the way they can reason about it. I, see. I think it's, it's probably similar in Rust. Okay. Mm. I'm sure you're still paying the cost in Rust somewhere. Yeah. But well, they, uh, the yeah, you, you should, features right? is what they call it. It's in, instead of a coroutine. Um, mm. You can stack out kit because it's size to be known there. So compile time. Mm. Uh, unless you are doing something with like okay, so it's oh, stack out okay. the yeah, order. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's yeah. good to know. Coroutine resumed. Um, <laughs> 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 basically, uh, so I can see like for the use cases to really use the coroutine, I think there has to be a parallel resource that is yeah. pretty happy in order to use it, right? Like we shouldn't use it if it's all like CPU, like without IOs, like it, it's better to just use that thread holes to for the CPU only, like kind of like. Uh, yeah. Exactly. yeah. But I think it could give you flexibility to be able to switch to. Like, yeah, somehow. Machine. Yeah. Machine. yeah. But if you are saying performance wise, <coughs> it doesn't get any benefit because you still use CPU thread. It, in, in my experience, I, I've done a good amount of like uh, async code. Um, it, the only time you really want to do it is if you, like, uh, you have underlying like uh, hardware support or like an API for async uh, operations. So like going to the GPU, uh, going to the network, mm -hmm. um, or in the advances of like the Linux kernel where you have uh, the ability to do async like disk operations, uh, mm -hmm. IO I earning. As well as another good place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in your example code, you had this loop where you basically check the status of the GPU work, and then if it wasn't completed or successful, you just delete it. You just suspended it. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to tell the scheduler? Like, I guess it's like an additional layer where you have to like go resume the code team, yes. and then you see that it's yes. not ready, and you jump back. Yeah. Is that like a built-in method just to tell the scheduler, hey, I'm not ready yet, don't even try resuming? Yes, you can use callback. So um, actually, I have another example. implementation. It's like, uh, I don't use this while loop, and I'll just call this CUDA loop kernel. And then I will insert a callback. Inside this callback function, I'll enqueue the task. So when you finish the kernel, CUDA runtime will call the callback. And inside the callback, you enqueue the task. So you don't need to pull in the, any status. Just use callback, and then let the queue callback enqueue the task back to the queue. And that's another function. So you can reduce the power consumption. OK, so, are you, so you're effectively removing it from the task queue and then the callback that's back in? Yes, yeah, it's a doable. Um, I just want to mention that there are other ways of using coroutines uh, where you, you don't necessarily have async uh, I.O., but maybe you want to uh, progress chunk by chunk. So maybe you have a coroutine that yeah. I want to read n number of bytes of a file, and then let another coroutine do its thing, then come back to me and read another chunk of a file. Um, or if you have like a game engine where you have uh, objects on animation, and you might have objects where uh, run this core team for you know ten milliseconds, advanced animation for ten milliseconds, mm -hmm. uh, and do that for every frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So conclusion is core team is useful. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thanks for coming. It wouldn't surprise me if the main use of the core team turns out to be exactly the thing you were talking about. The generally is basically converting nested loops with or loops with complex state into iterations, because that's you know, the alternative implementation to the thing you were talking about in class. <laughs> Where all the states it's in, and there are two methods, you know, like read a bit from file, process a bit of buffer, and you keep calling them like, but then all the status sits in the class member. Coroutine makes that a lot easier if the state is com is complex, and especially if you have a complex loop that you have to turn inside out. 
Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if that turns out to be the main use of coroutines. Right. Okay. PGF compiles different coroutines. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.